Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the April 2019 Nkata Omuibe. My name is Patrick Okibo. I'm one of the caretakers for Center for Memories. My co-travelers in this journey most of them are not here, include Ndidi Okonkwangwuneli, who leads us, Nkiru Opaleke, Jude Udo Ilo, and Nkem Mweke. Center for Memories was started a little over 15 months ago, and the objective of the center is to curate Igbo memories Igbo culture, Igbo traditions, create a space where we can have conversations about who we are. And some of our activities include exhibitions. In fact, we've got one uh, going on at the moment. We also have programs like this, discourses like this for adults. We have Nzuko Omwaka, which is something like this, but for kids. We have a book club for younger people, younger adults in Enugu. And most of these activities, the historical aspects of it, are curated by a resident historian who is with us here today, Professor Rina Okonkwo. Please, a round of applause for her. Please stand to be recognized. Nkata <laughs> Umuibe started actually 12 months ago, 12 months ago. And we've had it in this hall every month, except for January this year, when we felt that you know, people would be in their various villages drinking a lot of pan wine and might not turn up. So we didn't hold it in January, but we've held it every month. And when my my colleague Nana comes up here, I'm sure he'll do what he does best, which is to recount for us all the sessions we've had. <laughs> but we're, we're excited, we're really excited about the conversation we're going to have today. Oha, Mweze, governance matters. To be led by no person other than the chief priest himself, Dr. Joe Abba. If you don't know Joe Abba or you haven't heard of him, that means you don't have a smartphone. Because if you have a smartphone, you definitely have heard of him. But I'll leave Nana to do that introduction. I'm also super excited about the conversation that will follow after his presentation that will be moderated by Juliet Kego Ume Onido. A friend of mine saw her walk out of the car today and said, a force of nature. You will understand what that means when the interaction begins. Throughout the 12 or so editions of this, we, had, we organized it in partnership with Enugu Sports Club under the chairmanship of Chief Ben Etiaba, who ended his chairmanship last month. Please, a round of applause for him. I'm a I'm a I'm a all the time. All people like Ben Etiaba, Kagapo, Omwe Ife Siike Nidi Ime, Nye Ayame. Omwe Ife Siike Nidi Ime, Nye Ayame. Because he is not just a man with a vision, but a man who can stick with stuff, who can stick with things and walk it. Yeah? That attribute is very rare, and it's been a pleasure working with him these last 12 months. And we look forward to working with the new chairman, who, interestingly, was also part of that vision and part of midwife in this vision as deputy chairman of the club and has now assumed leadership as chairman of the club. Please, a round of applause for him. 
And we really look forward to continuing this journey under your guidance and leadership. And without further ado, please allow me to invite the chairman of Enugu Sports Club to offer his uh, welcome address. A round of applause for him, sir. Mm -hmm. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished members of Enugu Sports Club, and all the special guests here this evening. You are welcome to Enugu Sports Club. This is our monthly series of Onkata Mungu. We are all of us gathered together to discuss about our Igbo nation and how to move forward for a better Igbo. My job here is very simple, and this is the first official assignment as the executive chairman of the Sports Club. Please permit me to recognize every person here is an important personality, but permit me to recognize a few individuals here. Uh, first of all, I will recognize the media past chairman of Enugu Sports Club, my friend, my ally, my boss, whose, whose vision has transformed Enugu Sports Club to where we are today and where we will be moving tomorrow. Chibben Etiaba, you are welcome. I also recognize the prof who has brought this Nkatomi with Enugu Sports Club, Professor Okonkwa and the wife, you are welcome. <laughs> Permit me also to recognize the, the coordinators of Enugu, uh, Nkatomi, bro. Nana, you are doing a very wonderful job. Okibo, all of you are wonderful. I'm proud of you. And my darling friend, please, I forgot your name. Juliet, you are welcome. Thank you for the wonderful thing you guys are doing at the Nugu Sports Club. And then Katun I also recognize my brother who is here present, Chief Frank Mweke, the former Minister of Information. Thank you for coming. Also, our guest speaker. Welcome to your place. Welcome to Enugu State. Welcome to Enugu Sports Club. You are welcome. Permit me also to recognize the Commissioner for Local Government Matters. Honorable Chijo Kiyodoga. You are welcome, sir. Please, without wasting much of your time, my job here is very simple to welcome you to this program and also to promise you that this wonderful program will continue in our administration. <laughs> we will keep the light shining in every moment. We provide all the necessary logistics to make sure that this program continues. You are welcome. No, 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 no. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, without further ado, please allow me to invite the convener of Nkatomuibe, Nana Ude. So like Patrick said, uh, the Center for Memories, as part of the programs that they decided to uh, galvanize the Able Society with, came up with this idea, drawn from prehistorical nature of Ndibo to be deliberative, to discuss issues, to define and redefine narratives around contemporary issues. 
And like he said, in May this year, last year, sorry, we are still in March, May last year, we had the very first Nkata Umwebe here. The idea really behind this program is to connect the generations around certain strong Igbo narratives on values, on technology, on the society, and today on governance. So in May last year, we had Professor Chede Odenkalo. Uh, he stood here and spoke on Igbo Kunye. We usually have an Igbo topic and then an English writer, but today I'm going to focus on the Igbo topics today. I'm not going to do the English writer. So we had Odenkalo, and he spoke on Igbo Kunye. The next month in June, we had Professor Okay in Dibe all the way from the United States, and he spoke on HEDME. The next month, Dr. K. K. Chuku MNI came here to address us on AJ Ndo Emegene. And then DK Chuku Merije came in August last year. And his topic was Jidofo. In September last year, we had the leader of the Igbos, the PG of Fohanes Ndibo. And the topic he spoke on was Ifeje Malu Igbo. His was actually the only one that we didn't have any English writer to read, and that spoke well because he's the leader of the Igbos. Then we had our very first female speaker in October, Cheka Odua, who spoke on Nkiruka Azubuike. The next month, we had another female speaker, Yvonne Choman Banifu, and our topic was Gidi Gidi Bugweze. In December, we closed the year with Chuba Keshi. And the topic he chose to speak on was Kedo Ndianyebo. He asked a question on our identity. We started off this year, like Patrick said, in February with Chinenye Mbauzuku, who galvanized a lot of young people to speak on the contemporary subject of technology, Onyekwe Chiyekwe. And just last month, Ike Chuke was here and had a very profound lecture centered around Igbo entrepreneurship and the Igbo economy. And it, each of these events is not just about having a speaker come to address us or share a topic with us. Like you will see today, after each lecture, we'll have an interactive session because it's Nkata Umwibe. It's a conversation. So we listen to our guest speaker, and then we interact with our guest speaker. And that's going to happen today. This month, we have, he called him the chief priest. I call him the high priest. He's actually the high priest. He says him more. And part of my responsibility here is to give you a brief biodata of Ezemo about a chief priest. So, and this particular chief priest cannot have a brief biodata, but I'm going to try. He got his bachelor's degree in law from University of Calabar in 1985. The next year, he had his master's in business law from the London Guildhall University in UK in 1986. In 1992, he had his PhD on governance with a special focus on governance and public policy in 1992. He's currently serving as a visiting lecturer to that particular university. And he has worked extensively on public sector reform programs for the UK Department for International Development and the UK Prime Minister's Office. His last public assignment was as the Director General Bureau for Public Service Reforms. He got that appointment in 2013, and since then, he's been the country director. Since he left that position, he's been the country director of DAI in Nigeria. He's not just the chief priest. He's Mr. Governance. There is no other person in Nigeria that can speak on governance like Dr. Joe Abba. Thank you, sir. I'm 
I'm pleased to be back in Enugu. I was actually born here in Enugu, uh, but I'm from Ebo. And almost all through my life, I've often had to convince people that I'm, that I'm actually Igbo. My name doesn't sound Igbo. Indeed, when I was writing Jam, of course, like every Igbo boy, I wanted to go to the University of Nigeria. And my dad said, if anybody in the University of Nigeria looks at your name, Joe Abba, they will never admit you. You don't have an Igbo name. So you have two choices. You can either choose Chukwe Meka or Chukudi. The only Chukwe Meka I knew was a bad boy. So I chose Chukudi. And that's my middle name, although I wasn't given it from birth. But it's the name I then adopted. When I was about to get married, my wife is from Ogun State. Her, my mother-in-law asked her, this man that wants to marry you, what's his name? He said his name is Joe Abba. She said, ah, they've played my daughter 419. Which Igbo man do you know that is not Okeke or Okonkwa or Oweke? He told you he's a lawyer. Have you seen his certificates? Um, my wife came very humbly. Uh, Joe, you know that your certificate, where did you keep it? <laughs> because she needed to convince the mother that uh, I'm actually real. It's a great privilege to be invited to address such an august audience this evening. And Patrick and Nana have asked me to compress into 15 minutes something I've spent 33 years of my life working on uh, all over the world. Um, but I'm grateful that there's an opportunity to interact afterwards. So what I'll use my 15 minutes to do would essentially be to point the conversation that will follow in certain directions so that we can uh, engage further on some of them. I came here from Oweri uh, this afternoon because I had the privilege of having been appointed into uh, Governor-elect Emeka Ehedioa's uh, transition committee. And I'm in the committee on good governance. But as I was being picked up from, as I was picked up from Uweri Airport heading to the hotel, uh, somebody, a vehicle blocked our car. And it wasn't clear in which direction he wanted to go. And so the, the driver that picked me up sort of shouted at him, Puanozo, Iburochas. Um, for people who may, who may watch the video of this event later, who are not Igbo speakers, uh, I'll just interpret. It just meant, get out of the way. Are you Rochas? And so, all the way from where that event took place to my hotel, I kept reflecting on what exactly did he mean by saying Puonos or Iburochas? Did he mean why are you blocking the road? Are you Rochas that has the power to block the road? Is that what he meant? Or did he mean you don't know where you're going? Are you Rochas? <laughs> and I, I kept thinking about this until we got to the hotel. And unfortunately, I was so deep in thought that I actually forgot to ask him 
Which exactly did you mean? But it was pertinent for the topic I've been asked to speak on. Or how is it? If the earlier meaning of pornos or iburochas meant, do you think you're rochas who can block the road? Then, oboha weze, kobweze woha. I started to reflect on this as I considered the topic. And then, my thoughts moved on to the next usual saying, Ibuemweze. So, is it that Ibuemweze or Ohamweze? And when I was asked to speak on Ohamweze, did it mean the community has a king? Or did it mean the king belongs to the community and the community owns the king? Which exactly did it mean? And so if you reflect on this concept of Ibuemweze and Ohamweze, then you start to wonder, is the governor actually the king? or not. Don't forget that there is no Igwe or traditional ruler that does not get his staff of office from the governor. There is none that is not on the payroll of the state. There is none that a governor cannot depose if he really wants to. Don't also forget that perhaps the most important economic value in any society, apart from its people, which is land, is in the complete control of the governor. The governor can take over your land, demolish your property, and there's nothing you can do about it. He has immunity. If you take him to court, in 10 years' time, the court might hear your case and determine that he had injured you. His tenure is only, in eight, is only for eight years maximum. He would have left government by then. Let's even assume that by some miracle, you were able to get judgment against that action of the governor during the time he is there. And the court orders him to pay compensation. Do you think it's his own money he will use? He will use the money of all of us to pay that compensation. The governor influences who becomes a lawmaker. In fact, your governor will call you and say, hey, go and buy a form. If you go and buy a form without the governor, you're on your own. The governor gets recommendations about who to appoint as chief judge. And so when people call governors executive governor, it actually diminishes their power. Because it's not just the governor of the executive. He's actually the emperor. And so the governor is more powerful than any easy. Doesn't matter which one you call. The governor is more powerful. But how do we react to this situation? Is it not us Igbos that say that when a god becomes too powerful, we will remind it of the wood it was carved from? Have we been doing that? Have we been doing that? 
If at a point in the past, the Igbo had no king, I'm sorry to tell you, you do now. And that's why we must pay attention to issues of governance. And that's why I'm here to tell you that governance matters. But what is this governance that we talk about? I think it's important that we separate that from politics. They are related, but different. You see, politics is the activities through which one group gains power and control over the rest of us. It's a simple case of inclusion and exclusion. We want our people to be in power. We don't want their people. A bit like football. We support Arsenal. We don't support Tottenham. We support Manchester United. We don't like, we don't want Man City to win the league. Except that football is entertainment. This is real life. However, too often, it is that contestation for power that we tend to focus on the most. Which group will have power over us? Every four years, every eight years, we will change the players but the game never actually changes. We will change the personnel, but not much actually changes on the ground. And so when some of us refuse to align with any particular uh, uh, political group, it is because we see the problem as the system rather than the personnel. And so when you have uh, a system through which the president must, whether he likes it or not, have 36 ministers. Whether he needs it or not, he must have 36 ministers. When the system says that as a governor you have complete immunity, civil and criminal, when the constitution is not clear who exactly owns the budget, who is responsible for what, when the system is based on sharing rather than production, then it really doesn't matter who comes. You have a National Assembly that can choose how much to vote to itself because it has the power to do so. I worked as DG for four years. At the time I left, I was owing school fees. Everybody who stops being a legislator will get a severance allowance of millions because they can do it we've had a we've had a, a, a national conference that cost us a lot of money had a lot of very very good recommendations come out of it the people who can implement it are the national assembly all the amendments they've made most of the amendments to the constitutions they've made have been those that affect them not us. And so, the focus needs to start to shift a little bit from who gets power and who doesn't get power to what do people do with the power when they get it. And that is the difference between politics and governance. Governance is how that power and control is exercised for the benefit of the rest of us. It is my view that that is one area that we don't focus sufficiently on. And when we focus on this area at all, our focus is almost exclusively on the federal government. Jonathan did this. Buhari did that. Atiku will do the other. At the odd time, when we focus on state-level governance, we only ask two questions. Is he paying salaries? Is he building roads? Once you're paying salaries and you're building roads, you win every election in the Southeast. Everyone. 
Forget about everything else. Pay salaries and build roads. Local government doesn't even feature. Nobody even talks about local government at all. And the discussions among God's Igbos is, look, we don't need government. We just need to get government out of the way. Do our business and make money. We don't want government. Let them keep their government in Abuja. Let anybody who likes go and contest. We just want to make money and do our business. And this, this idea is not unique to Igbos. In fact, many of the classical economists say the same things. You just need to get government out of the way and allow the private sector to work, allow the markets to work. That's all you need to do. String government, make it as little as possible, uh, get them out of the way. Perhaps the foremost proponent of this idea is an economist called Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman once said, if you put the federal government in charge of the Sahara Desert, in five years' time, there will be a shortage of sand. But here is the problem. Without government action, the Sahara Desert is advancing southwards at the rate of six kilometers every 10 years. So every 10 years, six kilometers of arable land is wiped away. 350,000 hectares in Nigeria alone every year, being lost to the Sahara Desert. Is it then any surprise that we have a farmer headsman crisis? Because apart from any of the politics around it, there is simply an issue of survival. There's an issue of just having sufficient land both to farm on and to graze animals on. And that tension is almost automatic. That is why, perhaps, you should have the government in charge of the Sahara Desert. But what is this governance that I keep talking about? It's basically the way that power is exercised in a society. And it includes the capacity, the capacity of the government to formulate and implement sound policies and to deliver and ensure the delivery of services to its citizens. Now, I said one of its roles is to deliver or ensure the delivery of services to its citizens. It doesn't mean government must do everything itself, but it is government's responsibility to ensure that proper services are delivered to its citizens. And that's why I was quite disappointed, I think it was last week or the week before last, when the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission said, it is not our responsibility to provide meters to people. It's the responsibility of discos. And I say to them, if the discos are not doing it, it is your responsibility to make them do it. Because that is the proper role of government. But people look at the capacity of, governor, of government along about six, six main uh, measures. So they look at, if government, if, government, if government is said to be doing well, um, you look at how much voice do people have and how accountable is government. So how much voice do people have to question government? And how accountable is government to respond to that question? Is there political stability? So can you, can you choose your leaders in a stable way, devoid of violence? And I have to say that Nigeria has been making steady progression in its elections since, I think, 2011. Almost every election has been better than the last one, with the worst one perhaps being the, the, the 2003 elections. It's unfortunate that
that we have regressed in terms of political violence in the 2019 elections. But your ability to uh, uh, conduct free and fair elections devoid of violence is one of the measures of governance. Then you also look at gov government effectiveness. How effective is government at delivering uh, what it does? You look at regulatory quality. How well does it regulate? So again, we seem to have regressed from when at a point uh, during the tenure of uh, Professor Dora Quinley of blessed memory, the threat used to be, I will report you to NAVDAC. Now, our young men are drinking alcoholic concoctions at 9 a.m. in the morning, and there's no regulation. The, the chemists are again selling fake drugs with no regulation. Again, we've regressed in that regard. So the quality of regulation is also key as is the rule of law and the control of corruption. So how effectively government controls corruption, how effectively uh, the rule of law is enthroned are key measures of governance success. Why does it matter? Why do all these things I'm saying matter? Let me give you some quotes. The World Bank said, underlying the litany of Africa's development problems is a crisis of governance. Weak governance cannot readily support a dynamic economy. Weak governance cannot readily support a dynamic economy. Tony Blair said, the issue of good governance and capacity building is what we believe lies at the core of all Africa's problems. The late Kofi Annan said, good governance is perhaps the single most important factor in, er in eradicating poverty and promoting development. Barack Obama said, Development depends upon good governance. That is the ingredient which has been missing in far too many places for far too long. Finally, the, economy, the Economist magazine said, of all the ills that kill the poor, none is as lethal as bad government. I want us to reflect on that last one. Of all the ills that kill the poor, none is as lethal as bad government. Not malaria, not HIV AIDS, not uh, road accidents, not even juju from village people. Bad government is what kills the poor the most. But what is the other side? What is good governance? You can, you can define it as the representation of an unbiased state that puts the needs of the population as a whole first. The needs of the population as a whole first and that does not serve any agenda except the good of the people. Needs to put the needs of the population as a whole first and does not serve any agenda except the good of the people. Why is this important? It's important because the government and the economy are inseparable. If any government wants to take down Dangote today, it will only take 24 hours. Just 24 hours. If any government wants to take him down. And when you hear a lot of our people talk about the Asian miracle, because of course we've looked to the West and we're still not developing. 
So we've now started to look to the east. And you hear a lot of our people who tell you about China, and Malaysia, and Singapore, and Japan, and uh, many of these other Asian countries that were in a similar situation to us a few decades ago, but have now been able to transcend that position. What people don't tell you when they talk about the Asian tigers is actually how those countries use their governments to educate their people. How those countries use their government to subsidize their industries. How they delay the full adoption of free unregulated markets until they had a wealthy enough economy and mature enough industries. The United States started subsidizing technical research in universities in the 1800s. And it was the support of government that gave rise to schools like the Massachusetts Institutes of Technology, MIT, and the University, the University of California at Berkeley. You probably are not aware that it was army chemists that discovered the best way to purify water. You probably don't know that it was government scientists that developed the computer chip, the internet, your smartphone that you carry. How many people, were, how many people in the audience were old enough to own a Nokia 3310? Okay. So the difference between your Nokia 3310 and your iPhone or your, smart or your Samsung, the smart in your smartphone was invented by government scientists. The GPS was invented by government, not Google. So when I was coming here, I was saying, no, I'm going to Enugu Sports Club. Let me check it on Google. The GPS was invented by government scientists. The airbag in your car was invented by government scientists. I can go on and on and on. Apple, which is seen as one of the most innovative private sector organizations in the world, relies very heavily on government research. The iPod, the iPod came out of the research done by two government scientists for which they won a Nobel Prize. You probably don't know that. The display screen on your phone, on your iPhone, is from government research. Touch screens is from government research. Smaller chips, making the phones smaller and smaller and lighter, is from government research. Have I made the case for the importance of government in our lives? The question then is, what do we do about it? What do we do? There are things I think we need to pay more attention to. We need to be concerned about how government delivers public goods to citizens. That is health, education, infrastructure, security, how it gives us licenses, how it manages land. All of these things are of vital importance. We should not stop, we should not just stop at does he pay salaries, does he build roads. And I'm not saying this only as individuals. I'm also talking about our NGOs. Our foremost NGOs focusing on governance these days are hardly present in the Southeast. Those focusing on budget transparency, those focusing on procurement transparency, they're hardly in the Southeast. And we need to start to ask questions. If indeed, or how is it? We need to start to ask the questions of those people that superintend over our affairs. We need to pay attention to the checks and balances through which we hold government to account for its actions. And that includes how they spend our money. 
the capacity of our legislature. So let's not just focus on, let's not only focus on who becomes governor or who becomes president. Actually, the people that can do you the most damage is your legislature. They are the ones that can do you the most damage. And so if we don't start to pay attention on the quality of people that gets into our legislature, we are actually doing ourselves a lot of harm. Thirdly, we need to focus on the ability of our citizens to participate in the, program, in the, in the process of governance. And by this, I don't only mean elections. As many of us as possible should put ourselves forward to run for elective positions. I say that being someone who has vowed not to run for elective uh, pos position. I say that because I'm a Christian. The Bible talks about the five gifts of the Holy Spirit. Contesting election is not my gift. <laughs> my gift is advising and guiding those in power. That's what I do well. And that's what I'm able to, uh, to, to offer. But we need to participate in the way that we are governed. All of us. And a very good example of that was two years ago when all the women groups in Kano State got together and itemized what they wanted to see in the Kano State, in the Kano State budget. All the women, the various women groups came together and said to the governor, this is what we want to see in the budget. Now, you will be interested to know what happened. Did the governor eventually include those things? How many did he include? Did he actually implement them? And those will be important questions. The important issue for me is that it happened. Is that the women realized that this person, or anywhere, we should tell him what we want for him to put in the budget. I submit that we need to start to think in that way. You don't need to be in government to focus on governance. Lagos is seen as one of the better managed states in the country. For quite a while, Lagos has kept faith with the process of development planning. Even when the federal government stopped doing development plans, Lagos carried on doing development plans. Every year, Lagos has a summit, an economic summit, called the Ingberti Summit. And my brother, uh, the former DJ of NESG, former minister Frank Weke, knows what I'm talking about. But here is what happened. All of that planning is done collectively by the key stakeholders. So, what was the outcome? What was the outcome of this? The outcome is that there's a plan for how Lagos will develop going forward. The key stakeholders felt that a particular governor was beginning to deviate from that plan. And they went to their leader and said, this man is deviating from this plan. We don't want him anymore. We don't want him to come back for a second term. Many people thought, oh, it was this leader that said, I don't want you again. But the leader is a politician. He's smart. He knows that if the key stakeholders come and say, we don't want this man, and he doesn't listen, he risks his own leadership position. This is what has happened in Lagos. Um, we Igbos don't have such a leader that I'm aware of. And when Ashiwa Jubala Tinumbu was asked, who made you the leader of the Yorubas? You know, I told you I'm a Christian. Okay. He said, I'm a Muslim. 
And when we Muslims gather to pray, when we Muslims gather to pray, Prof. Samuel Halu walks in and Okay, what he actually said, when they asked him, who made you the leader of the Yorubas? How did you become the leader of the Yorubas? What he said is that I'm a Muslim, and when Muslims gather to pray, it is the first person that steps forward that leads the prayers. There is no election. There is no nomination. It is whoever steps forward first. That's the person that leads the prayer. And as I, as I was just about to say that, Prof. Samoanu walks in. There's a need for us to think beyond one state. There's a need for us to think as a region, as a people. There's a need to th for us to think about our economy as a regional economy. There's a need for our governors and our leaders to invest in technology. There's a, need for, there's a need to invest in research in our universities. There's a need to bring back technical education, vocational education, into Ibo land. There's a need for us to go into the public service. We cannot be only in the, pri in the, in the private sector. As at the time that the Civil War broke out, virtually every, every major government position of an intellectual nature was held by an Igbo man. At the, at the breakout of the Biafran War, virtually every innovation in terms of technology was coming out of the Southeast. We need to go back to that. We need to encourage our people. We need to invest in technical education. We need to invest in research. Building roads is important. Paying salaries is important. But applying your brain as to how you can energize an entire regional economy is perhaps even more important. We need to unleash the potential that has been latent in us for the last 50 years. We need to get over the civil war. It is done. We need to take charge again. We need to lead again. And we need to do that by deed and not just by word. We need to do that collectively with a united vision for what we want from our people rather than mundane political differences. Many, many of you would have come across a book called Why Nations Fail by Asimoglu and Robinson. And he talked about the importance of institutions. Suffice it to say that, and, and when he talks about the importance of institutions, he talks about the need not to focus too much on the personality, but to focus on how things are done. We grow wiser every day. Their forthcoming book is called The Leviathan. The Leviathan is the state. Let me end with a quote from the World Bank World Development Report, 1997. It says, and I quote, state-dominated development has failed, but so will stateless development. Development without an effective state is impossible. Thank you for your time. Please, another round of applause for that speech. And I'll quickly invite the moderator for the session, Juliet Kego Ume Onyido.
A round of applause for her. Juliet is the co-founder of Whole Woman Network. She would spend the next 10 to 15 minutes uh, in a moderated discussion, and then we open it up for audience participation. Great. So it gives me great pleasure um, and honor to really moderate this session because this is, um, um, other than that the topic is something that speaks to my heart, um, it's also with someone that I have a lot of respect for and who's really versed um, in the subject. So what's going to happen is that I have so many questions for Dr. Joe, but I'm not going to ask too many questions because what we want this to be is really Nkata Umuibe. So I'm going to ask only two or three questions and then give more time to everyone in the audience to be able to participate because that is really why we're here, the interactive session. And um, the first question that I have for, uh, um, for you, Dr. Joe, is this is that based on all you've talked about, um, you really identify that we have a systemic problem, not so much individuals. And there's, um, there's a clamor in Nigeria for a change in the structure of the nation that came up um, during the elections. And a lot of people have different opinions on what that structure um, should look like. So now my question is this, in a situation where we have a government in power that has clearly said they are not going to restructure. How then do we create systemic changes in Nigeria and in Alibo specifically? Okay. Thank you, uh, Julia. Um, before I answer, I just, I just uh, spotted my elder brother, uh, architect Ferdinand Agu. Who, who came into the room. And there's a story I must tell about uh, architect Ferdinand Agu. Um, at the time that uh, um, the government was about to change from the Jonathan government to the Buhari government, I was, I was still in government at the time, uh, the government set up a transition committee. And that transition committee had DG NAVDA, Controller General Customs, Chairman FRS, DG NIMASA, all sorts of people. So, somebody said to Payo Zayim, all these people you've gathered, how many of them has written anything in their lives? Where is uh, Dr. Abba? Where is Ferdinand? He said, no, they are part of my office now. They don't need to be in the committee. So, Every week, um, the APC will complain. We're not getting handover notes. They don't want to give us. They don't want to give us. Um, and every week, I think it was uh, the Vice President, Amadi Sambo, that was the chairman of the transition committee. So every week, they will promise the VP that by next meeting, definitely the handover notes will be ready. Definitely by next meeting, it will be ready. So... One day, uh, Pius and you said, Hey, DJ, come, I want you to accompany me somewhere. So we went. It was to a meeting of the transition committee. Ferdinand was there. So uh, the same promise was made. By next week, the handover notes will be read. These are the kinds of things that happen in government, too. These are, these are our government is run. <laughs> so. The, the vice president said, does anybody have anything to say? So I raised my hand and I said, oh God, these Andover notes will never come. There's no structure. There's even no index. There's no, there, we don't even know how we're going to go about it. So he said, ah, okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to set up a technical committee of the transition committee. <laughs> and DG, you'll be there. Ferdinand, you'll be there. So a few of us that write uh, were, were included. Yeah. So we now, and they said 
that committee must meet immediately after this meeting. So immediately after the meeting, we went to the banquet hall. We met. Uh, he had a conjoy while I had a um, Minister of State for Planning, Minister of Transport, a few other people. So they met and they said, you know, out of all of us, it's only really, really three of you that have ever written anything. So what's going to happen is we're going to set up a working committee <laughs> of the technical committee <laughs> of the transition <laughs> committee. <laughs> and Dr. Joe, architect Ferdinand, you people will be the members and we will give you engineer and make easy because he's been in government for a long time. He will be able to guide you people. So when they left, it was three of us left. You know how I told you that because of my name, I always have to explain that I'm actually Igbo. So the three of us now sat. Engineer is now said, ah, CEO, three of us are Igbo. Uh, Ferdinand, how old are you? I think Ferdinand said about 55 or so at the time. Joe, how old are you? I said, I'm 50. Okay, well, he said, well, I'm 58, I think he said. And according to Igbo culture, <laughs> it is the youngest person that does the work. <laughs> and so I had to beg architects, Ferdinand, to help me. And not many people around the country actually know that the handover notes from Jonathan to Buhari were compiled and edited by me and Ferdinand Agu. Okay. Back to your question on restructuring. The difficulty with it is that if you ask 20 Nigerians what restructuring means, you get 20 different answers. For some, restructuring means going back to a regional structure that we had in the past. For some, it means going back to parliamentary government away from presidential government. For some, it means renegotiating the fiscal arrangements we have and how we share our resources. For others, it means complete cessation. We want to secede completely. And so when a politician talks about restructuring, we must always ask, what do you mean exactly? What is going to change as a result of what you are promising? If anybody cannot offer you that, they are simply playing politics. That's all they are doing. They are simply playing politics. And that's why when, the, when President Buhari came in, um, we were given an opportunity to brief him. And during that briefing, he said, I will never read the report of the National Conference. I will never read it. And we said, why? He said, because it was developed with money that was spent when kids were on strike. Universities were on strike. I'll never read it. Okay. Do your own now. You don't like that one, Abby. Do your own. But we must have a dialogue. We must have a dialogue to identify what it is that holds us together as a nation. Some of it we will not always agree on. We will not always agree on that. But there are some that are blindingly obvious. It will be very difficult to justify a federal government that consumes 52% of our resources, while 36 states and 774 local governments share 48%. It, it will be difficult if we all come together to say, let's discuss it. It will be difficult for anybody to justify that kind of sharing arrangement. 
And there are many others like that that would be very, very difficult to actually, uh, to actually justify. So I think that discussion needs to happen. And I think, and one of the things I had said in the run-up to the elections is that whether you support APC or you support PDC, PDP or you support YPP or you support whoever it is you support, the important things for us to do is to come together and agree on those fundamentals that we must campaign for in every party. In every, it doesn't matter which party you support. But let us have things we want as Nigerians that we want to demand of every party. And that's because the, the, the problem that we have is that a lot of these problems are constitutional in nature. And the people who have the power to, to change that constitution are exactly the people who are benefiting from it. That is why I often say, we've entered a one-chance vehicle that has no brakes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my next question is a follow-up to this one. So um, if we're to, for instance, keep aside the, the, what happens at the federal level, right? Um, in terms of saying this is um, probably not within our control, and then come to the regional level, as in the Ibu, right? What, how, rather, do you think that the Igbo nation, the Igbo can come together and create a framework, just like you talked about, that is, regardless of the political party for Anambra, Imo, Eboni, you know, all, all the states, Abia, um, regardless of who comes into power, we say these are the things that we want. The same way like the women of Kano, how they came together, but it's now Oha, You know, right? So these are the things, regardless, and these are the things that you will adhere to. So basically, how do we create a system of accountability that hinges on distributed leadership, which is really what Igbos are known for, and not the emperor style of leadership. Thanks. That's why I gave you the example of Lagos and how key stakeholders in Lagos were able to come together and agree on what they wanted of Lagos. I think this is something that Igbo elders can also do, uh, which is why I might be in a minority of one, but it is why I believe that Ohaneze made a mistake in endorsing any particular candidate. Ohaneze should simply have said, these are the things we want. And should have given those demands to everybody that came to see to seek its support. I think, I think the less political Ohaneze becomes, the better it is for the region. So I think... And, and, and when I say the less political, I mean the less partisan political or an easy becomes, the better it is for the region. I was in, I was in a fortunate situation where, did I tell you I'm from a boy? Okay. I'm sorry, I have this complex. I need to keep repeating that I'm Igbo. Mm. <laughs> so, I was in a fortunate situation where my current governor, uh, Dave Umai, I had, a, I had an opportunity to interact with him before he became governor and uh, He's a very humble person. He comes to my house whenever he's in Abuja. Uh, he, he consults, he listens. And one of the very early things uh, I said to him was, look, um, the people that elected you are the people of Eboi. They are the ones you owe. Don't go fighting anybody. Don't go fighting anybody. Um, for the, the, there was something called a conditional grant scheme that the MDG office was given. If a government is able to design a project um, uh, for up to one billion naira, the federal government will match it with another one billion naira. For the first seven years of that scheme, Ebony State did not apply. 
For the first seven years, Eboin State did not apply. Donors were not coming to Eboin because the governor will say, I don't have counterpart funding to pay. Somebody wants to come and provide water for your people. You don't have counterpart funding to pay. Suffice it to say that in the last three months, USAID projects worth 350 million US dollars everybody will benefit from. That is apart from key federal government initiatives on agriculture, on mining, that everybody is benefiting from. We're not fighting anybody. We just want to provide public goods to our people. I'm in Enugu now, so I want to be careful. I don't want to compare our capitals, Abakaliki and Enugu. <laughs> but given where we are coming from, given where we are coming from, um, I think you can see tremendous progress just by having a leadership that is willing to listen. And so, and so I think Igbo elders have that duty they have that duty to be able to come together and say, this is what we want from this region. And that will ensure that you don't have a rogue governor. I will name no names. You don't have a rogue governor that goes off and starts molding statutes. <laughs> when the people don't have water to drink when pensioners have not been paid. At least, at least, if these elders are able to muster their clout sufficiently to ensure that somebody that behaves in a particular way does not get a second term, our uh, people will start to listen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask this last question and then I'll open it up um, to... The I think Namna is telling me that, you know, so, so what happened is I'll open it up to the floor and after the dialogue, um, you know, the session, we can all engage Dr. Joe also. So, uh. Yeah, um, thank you so much. My name is Joy Ngozi Ezilo. Uh, I'm the Dean of Law, uh, Faculty of Law, University of Nigeria, and the founder of uh, WACO, which is an NGO that is uh, well known also in this uh, region. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joe Abba, for that uh, presentation. I think, um, you know, um, finding a premise for what I want to say is not just something that can quickly be said by another moderator by my side telling me one minute, but I'll try to make it short. Um, you talked about federal structure and then uh, the part restructuring and meaning different things to different people. I agree entirely with it, and then, uh, but at the same time, I mean, for us and for our people as Igbos, we, ex we understand, I believe, what it means, given increasingly our position in the, federal, in the Federation of Nigeria. And we believe that that may be what will give us a greater leverage. But looking at the, 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 the whole politics of it, for me, I think our major problem is that the demand side is so weak even for Southeast, to demand accountability from our leaders. And it has come to a stage, I don't know, we've gotten it so wrong, internalized all the wrong values. I find myself even preaching everywhere about how we have to not only demand the power of questioning and then even the power of, you know, doing the right thing. And you see, you know, our governors going so off, being roguish because they can afford to, because we have ceased to exist. I still give it to my colleagues and counterparts in the Southwest. And I, we are telling ourselves the truth that no found the democracy of this country. Because when we want to demand and make that issue an issue, it becomes an issue in the front burner of national discourse. And they will succeed in what they want to. But in our own case, we have come to a side that people cannot say, even when we see this is a bad leader, an epitome of bad governance, we end up again voting for the person and how are we going to get out of this conundrum and for us even in the non-profit organization and the issue of uh, that we talked about I think we did huge project voices to the people power 
Voice in Power project. And we come up with that the South is the, is South, the whole entire region is littered with abandoned federal government project. And it was the highest. And we have the figures and the statistics to back it up. Don't we have people representing us that can push this, including even the governors in all the Southeast? But again, on the other side, we have seen what development driven by people can do to a state like Anambra. That you can see what it can do to places like Anambra, that even when the UN, for example, do the mapping, and you are familiar with international organizations as, as much as I am, that they are now envy of many organizations that they came up and said that even in terms of development, the development is even, even here, so to speak, that you can move from rural area to city. How did that happen? What happened to above those days? And why can't we recreate some of this? So I think we can begin to think about this. This is not a one-day conversation, but it's something that has to be ongoing. And I know for us, it, it's not going to be easy. But we thank God that we have to struggle for everything. Recently, I was appointed by United Nations Secretary General as one of the seven, you know, advisors, civil society, on civil society advisory board in, in February this year. And one, of course, has to be from Nigeria because everybody came from different regions. And I know what perception of people that people are so talented, but yet we've not been able to mobilize that internally to demand the highest accountability from our governors. Thank you so much. My name is Emeka Ayokwe. I'm an auditor with Amin Ibrahim and co chartered accountant Sabuta. I'm also the UPP House of Reps candidate for the past for the just concluded election. I have a question for Dr. Joe Abba. He said the, the, one of the five gifts of the Holy Spirit is uh, for you, you don't want to be directly involved in politics. You rather involve yourself in governance. Some people will say uh, power is power. Some people will say knowledge is power. I have a, I've seen a lot of good best brains inside this building this night. I'm seeing Frank. I'm seeing... So the question is, at some point as a little child, I saw former Minister of Information vying for governorship here. Why won't you be directly involved? Why would you wait for Ihebio Heart to borrow the best brain, calling in Imo State? Are we going to be waiting for them to borrow like the best brain here? Professor Kinsley Mohalo, the APC now and government, are they going to borrow him also in Abuja? Get directly involved. Good day, everyone. I'm Heather Ogachukode, and I just have a direct question for uh, Dr. Joaba. Uh, you're a man who has been in governance, and you have also been out of governance. And you have all these great, you have great ideas on how to make um, government change. But my question is, when you are in government, why was it so hard to institutionalize all these ideas? What was the problem? What was the challenges you met? What was the things that actually stopped you from actually making these your ideas to be something we can actually benefit from right now as an institution? Not as uh, you as a person, but as an institution. Thank you. Okay, my name is Ezenwa Angomno. I'm a lawyer, and I just want to ask a question. If I understand your pitch, Dr. Joe, that we should set the agenda for governance. Now, my question is, how do we do this? Since the traditional institutions are failing us, is it that we need to start gathering ourselves into small, small groups and in order to set this agenda? And how can we sustain it over a period of time in order to have a different narrative from what we have today, where the person in government is Mr. Know-all and nobody says anything to the contrary if you must be with him. So I want to know how do we go about it. What do you propose? Thanks, Rachel. And I represent Refreshing Hope Youth Initiative. We work for young people and educating and empowering them. My question, uh, first of all, I want to appreciate Dr. Joe Thank you for a well-delivered thing and for also Juliet. 
Thank you. I was wondering while I was sitting here because I came here because I had Nkata Umibe. So I was looking forward to hearing a lot of people. But incidentally, it's all grammar. It's all grammar. And I am like, am I in the right place? And that's one thing. And you mentioned a Boeing state, how good it is infrastructurally. I've driven past that area and I see a lot of improvement besides what I've heard also in the villages. But now I'm wondering, how do you sustain what has, uh, how could it be sustained? Um, yes, the process that uh, Dr. Omahe has begun in a boy instead. How could it be sustained so that it's not when he leaves office, then um, it goes back? Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to go to the boy. I'm a quivan eco general ego. I was also quivan even now. Okay, by even now, so quite was. Uncle, even in a new, no, 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 Eh? I'm so happy. So so happy on you, Bruno. Don't go no more. Okay. Um. I think I think uh, a number of issues were were actually raised that 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 were of vital importance. Um. And the last one, which the, the young lady raised about how do we sustain these, uh, these initiatives that have been, these laudable initiatives that are going on in Ebony State. And it's a very important one because virtually all of our governors who have made appreciable progress have tended to do so by bypassing the institutions of government. So Peter will be bypassed the civil service and went to the church. And that was how he delivered uh, most, of what he, most of what he delivered. Um, my governor uh, recognizes the importance of the civil service but doesn't see them as the key driver uh, to, to the state. So, so when he won his second term, I said to him, Your Excellency, you've done extremely well in terms of infrastructure, you've achieved amazingly with the little resources you have, because that point it gets about the least uh, federal allocation in the country. So you've done amazingly well in, in, in what you've done, but you need to now start to focus on institutionalizing the, uh, the, the machinery of government. Otherwise, you will just come and go and you'll be another person, but you need to focus on that in your second term. So it's a very, very important point. You can't do everything. You can, you can isolate three or four key levers that you can focus on that can ensure uh, sustainability beyond your, beyond your tenure. So I don't have an easy answer. I recognize the importance of what you said, and it is something that I'll continue to reflect on and, and, and advise uh, His, His, His Excellency the Governor about. Uh, Professor Zillow's point is a very important one. And the, the, the importance of it is something that many people don't actually realize. That in order to demand, you need knowledge. If you don't have knowledge, all you're doing is making noise. You need to have knowledge, and you, and you need to have a route to power. That's the difference between John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. One was a voice shouting in the wilderness, make straight the path of the Lord. The other one could turn water into wine. Which one will you go to? And so there's a need to understand the subject in order to be able to demand intelligently. Our people need to be able to read a budget. 
we need to be able to read a policy document. When the, when the State House of Assembly is debating a bill, we need to go and say this is what we think. We need to be able to engineer debates. And I'm hoping that at some point, even if it's twice a year, this Nkataomibe program goes to the universities and that we have this dialogue in the universities. Our people need to, our people need to understand what it is we are talking about when we say restructuring. They need to understand what we are talking about when we say economic growth. When we say poverty reduction, they need to understand what all of these things mean in order to, to be able to make demands that make sense. The second issue was uh, why is Dr. Joe not running for office? Do you remember what I said when I was distinguishing between politics and governance? I said we obsess too much we obsess too much about politics, about should it be Dr. Joe or should it be Juliet. We need to move beyond that. We need to move beyond that. There are people whose opinions affect what happens in this country more than the people you read in the newspapers. I'm working hard to be one of them. And, and, like I said, we all need to recognize our strengths. I do not have the strength to have 200 people turn up in my house every day. <laughs> I don't have the strength. I don't have it. I don't, I don't have the ability. I don't have the ability to tell you I'm going to do this when I know I don't have the capacity to do it. And the Greek, the Greek philosopher said, man, know thyself. I know myself. I know myself. And that is why I was fortunate, I was privileged to have been invited by Professor Mohalu to contribute some thoughts when he was putting together his uh, campaign documents. I go to Kaduna, and I lecture for El Rufai's uh, people. He has a, a fellowship. And this is the kinds of things. When we are, when we are here molding statutes, El Rufai has 30 young people, first class degrees, from all over the north. First class. And then he's chosen one person from each geopolitical zone. To, uh, to join them. And he gets Jaga to come and talk to them about elections. He gets uh, Dan Gote to come and talk to them about business. He gets Joe Abba to come and talk to them about governance. And so tomorrow, tomorrow, our uh, people will still say Northerners are illiterates. They are preparing for the future every day. And so I get called by Erufai, uh, uh, Professor Moalu, Mo YPP. I get called by Erufai, APC. I get invited to come and advise uh, Emeka Hedioha, PDP. I think that is the value I can add to my country. And I feel privileged to be able to do so. And I can do so without seeking power. I think there are different kinds of power of which political leadership is only one. Um, um, what? Yeah, let me just ask you the question. Um, one other question that someone asked was, um, what were the challenges you met while you were in government? And the final one, how do we set an agenda for our, our government? Okay. So, the business of governance 
is about challenges. There is no other business. You're, you're between the devil and the deep blue sea. That is the business of governance. And that is why when after four years any particular government is still blaming the previous government, people will rightly say, but we elected you to come and solve the problem. Because that is your job. That's what you are elected to do. That's the mandate that people give to you to do. So there will always be challenges. And there are also a certain fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental issues in government. One, you will never have enough money to do everything you want to do. Two, you will never have enough time to do everything you need to do. And so for somebody that does public service reforms, like I do, people often ask me, these are your reforms. Has it achieved anything? And if it has, why are we still where we are today? In the year 2000, I was in my office in London, in the Audit Commission, when I got a message that the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, wanted to see me to join his team. First thing I said was, this country is finished. Am I the, am I the best they can find? Am I the best they can find? How, me, ordinary me, with my Nigerian accent. How is that possible? And the office I was asked to set up was the Prime Minister's Office of Public Service Reforms. The UK has been a nation for at least a thousand years. They are still reforming today. Why? Because reforms is taking something from its current state to a better state, and that is a continuous process. It never ends. By the way, that's why people like me will always have a job. <laughs> so, so, um, so I went into government to do two things. Basically, reposition ministries, reposition agencies, and make them more functional. Of course, the politics, um, the politics is always front and center of, of all of this. So we, did, we did actually make a lot of progress. Um, but the bureau I ran was, if you like, an internal consultancy to government. When you are an internal consultancy to government, there is often a patient-doctor relationship. So it is actually not everything you do that is in the public domain. If I start to tell you some of the things I worked on, you'll be surprised. I worked on atomic energy in Nigeria. I worked on desertification and slowing down the advance of the Sahara Desert. I worked on EFCC, road safety, extractive industries transparency initiative, UBEC. I can go on and on and on. But when people ask me, oh, and there were a few successes, I believe we made it easier for Nigerians to obtain and renew their driver's licenses. There are still challenges, but we made it easier. We made it easier for Nigerians to obtain their passports. There are still challenges in particular places, particularly Lagos. But in the diaspora, you can get your Nigerian passport in one day in the UK, in the US, many other countries. Um, what were the challenges we faced? Because the, the, the Controller General of Immigration is not willing to stop the racket in the passport system in Nigeria. That is the simple truth. There's nothing Joaba can do about that other than to recommend and say, this is what you need to do. But unless the person with the authority to do so is willing to do so, it will not change. 
The other thing we worked on was making it easier to get tax clearance certificates. So you can get your tax clearance certificate electronically now from the Federal Inland Revenue Service because the chairman was willing to, uh, to, to adopt the recommendations that we, we, we made. We're doing some work with the, we did some work with the Nigerian Identity Management Commission um, to start to get the focus on, sorry, I hope I'm not running over time too much, but I'll take, I'll take comfort from what the Emma of Kano once said, uh, Professor Moalu's former boss. He said, if you invite me to talk, you must allow me to talk. <laughs> okay. So, we, we, we started to shift the focus of national identity from having the plastic card to focusing on the number. And so today, you can go to a bank with your national identity number and conduct a banking transaction with no other identification. Okay. So, so when people ask me, what was the most important thing that you achieved in government? I'll say that it, it is shifting the focus of public service reform away from focusing on the public service to focusing on the public. Before now, most of the reforms were about tenor policy, monetization policy, sale of government houses. It was all about us. Nothing to do with my grandmother in the village. Nothing to do with my grandmother in the village. And that's why when I became DJ, I asked people, what do you want us to focus on? And they said, we want you to focus on issues of a licensing nature. Passports, driver's license, national identity, tax clearance. Those are the things that affect us when we get in contact with government. And that is why I'm so pleased that having started that movement, we've now started to focus on ease of doing business, making it easier to do business in Nigeria, visa on arrival, all of those things. So, my achievement was the starting of a movement rather than specific initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. And so now we're going to go to the other side of the hall. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nkem Anweyiago. If you can pronounce that, then you are Igbo. <laughs> um, please, um, I would like to draw our attention to just one problem that I think my Igbo young people have. I've been able to let my children leave this country and stay abroad. They are doing very well. But I wonder why or how the younger ones that are not attracted to the Igbo state could cope. Because number one, we don't have industries. And recently I read from a write-up written by a former head of state that it is deliberate so that most people don't come to the East to seek for anything. Rather, most Igbos go outside the state to look for jobs because there are no industries, there are no factories, and it is done on purpose. Please, how do we attract our children back to the East to do what they know how to do best? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Can I see you? Yeah. I wasn't sure whether the elders should be part of this conversation. And we thought we should leave the stage for the young ones. Center for Memories, Darun. In 1966, Tafawa Belewa was the prime minister and he called a meeting of the common wealth heads of states when they arrived after the meeting it was about the declaration of independence of uh, rhodesia in those days they had a banquet in the evening seated on one table was our former finance minister and the then prime minister of singapore Lin Kwayu. Okotiebo, the then finance minister, turned to Lin Kwayu and said, I will soon retire. I have already banned the importation of shoes because I have a shoe factory. 
I don't know whether you guys got this. He is banning the importation of shoes because he has a shoe factory. So, Joe, the, your point. There must be value in leadership. What did Lin Kuan Yu say after that experience? He said, I went home to my hotel room and I knew that these were a different set of people with a different set of values. Values for transformation would be the same. It has no color, no race. This was a man that took a country from where they were to a first world. So the same is still the issue for now, because you were mentioning about governors. One person determines who is a councillor, who is a senator, who is a house of reps, and on and on. I don't want to be too long, but maybe the next conversation will be, let's discuss this thing we have turned upside down. No nyebuigu keunes. That's a very dangerous statement. No nyebuigu keunes. And I ask my people, ayabuigu. What of the character of the carrier of the ego? What of the experience of the person who is carrying the ego? What of the knowledge of the person who is carrying the ego? You know, you're asking whether the governor knew where he was going. What if the ego is your last meal, not the poisonous? Maybe that should be the next Nkata Umibe. So that we can reverse that thinking that all you need is money for you to become a leader. Thank you very much. Is I work for one of the banks, Telling Bank. What I actually want to ask, very short, what will it take for, from the story you gave us about the transition committee, committee, subcommittee, sub sub committee, and subset committee, and eventually it was only three people that did that, can we not get a very little subset that can do chart a course for the Igbo nation? That everybody will buy into. We have the we have the uh, um, privilege of the internet. Honestly, if we have a few people, because too many cooks spoil the boss, just a few people. We know what we want as the people. We know what is good for us as the people. Can we get a few people, ten maybe, and let's start a course. This is what the evil person wants. Our culture, our values. What, where are we going to? Where do we intend to go to? When we get that, then we can turn to various avenues to make people have a buy-in. Honestly, Patrick does not know me, but I follow him on Facebook. He doesn't even know me. I came from Kaduna, and I wanted to be here because it is very, very important that people, especially people who have something here, we should change the directive. Five Igbo boys told in Dubai is now the whole Igbo race. Four Igbo boys got a bronze in the Algeria, but it's not news. It's not news. So we need to have a subset that will check the cost for us, and then we will move. So my question is, what does it take? What would it take for people like Joe Abba to set up this kind of thing for us? Okay, and I'll try to go straight to my point. Um, on the issue of, I'll try to marry the two issues together, and it has to be with government and private sector. Because I think, uh, from my own experience, in the private sector, we tend to have a lot of interference by the government. And speaking of the issue of regional uh, development by the state government, and I believe that a lot of us here have access to the state government. When it comes to the private sector, a lot of people want to invest. But I believe that if, as a whole, the states, they are diff every state, we know what is unique to each state. Every state, any state, people say civil service, Anambra, business, uh, uh, entertainment, uh, mineral resources, and a whole lot. I believe if the states can actually come together, the same way we are here, we can actually create a roadmap that private sector can actually say, okay, if you're coming to invest, this is an area I want to focus on. Because it's something that is collectively done. Afambo Frank, Mweke, the second. 
Dr. Joaba, it's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I'm making it the very eminent sons of Igbo land. Noeba and Abania. Um, the intro you Pupo, the Basal, or Chichi, Nani, issue of leadership. Leadership, whether you're looking at it as an Igbo person or an Igbo land, whether it is at the national level, at the global level. We talk this the issue of leadership is critical for any kind of human progress. Whether you're looking at it as an entrepreneur, as a business, whatever, even as a family, you must be able to provide the right kind of leadership. Disciplined, purposeful, visionary, in order for you to make any kind of progress. So that is not debatable. And so the point I want to make is the fact that no society, by whatever name called, wherever they may be located, can make any kind of progress by accident. Development and progress, deliberate, very deliberate, persistent, consistent, and must be progressive. So, I stop with Ibani Nainasu. We must still come back to the issue of leadership, quality leadership, visionary leadership, courageous leadership, honest leadership, value-based leadership. That is not contestable. And yet, if the Nigerian nation or the Igbo nation were allowed, without interference, to choose its leadership, I am sure that perhaps the outcomes we have today will be largely different. And so the question then is, why have we remained in the situation we are today? Nationally, regionally, why? I note the copious references you made to the statute, the statute building individuals all over the nation. And the question is, while all that was going on, we lost our voices. Where were the elders? Where were the citizens? Where were the people? He's no longer there or he's about to leave. Our voices have returned. And so I have Professor Moralu sitting here. And a lot of us may have followed, some of you may have followed his campaigns. Would anybody sitting in this audience tonight tell me, I'm okay, Tozo, Tozo, or not or not or that he could not stand his ground, or that he was talking nonsense? If anybody stands up to say it, I will respectfully, most respectfully disagree. But even from the beginning, I understood clearly that that candidacy was imperiled. Not because he had not the capacity, not because he could not be, lead the country, but because of the very structure, the very uh, sense of values I wear as a people. And so even as Oyibo, how many votes were attributed to him in Ebola? So the question then is, why was that the case? So Professor Wu makes reference to the issue of Onye uh, And I want to ask you a question, something I've discussed with Patrick a few times. And that is, there's a dilemma. The dilemma is that the problem, or the, answer, the solutions to our problems, to our leadership problems at least, let me localize it that way, is with the people. But the problem is also with the people. The problem is also with the people. And so if you decide that all you are worth is that uh, gather 100 people, 200 people, and 10 bags of rice is all we are worth, or 4 bags of salt is all we are worth, or 50 naira put on top of it is all we are worth, and people are licensed to then, to then, you know, loot the treasury all over the country, who do you honestly have to blame for that? But there's a dilemma. What is that dilemma? The dilemma is this. Can you know honestly? Tell a, 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 a man, a family person, who has, say, four children, let me leave it at that, or five, who has no job, who needs to pay school fees, who needs to pay hospital fees, who needs to pay rent, who needs to feed the children, that if an offer was made for even one cup of rice, that it should in good conscience decline it. That, to me, is a dilemma. That, to me, goes to the heart of the problem, the challenge of leadership, 
not just in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Igbo land, but in the entire Federation. And those will be my submissions. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, uh, Dr. Joe. Uh, because how did you as a youth? Uh -huh. um, especially uh, election in Kaatola, now. From my own observation, uh, a lot of Igbo youth participation in governance. Makana Opuro in fact or to the Megona government, both in the state, local government to presidents, now they may put the core issues, especially Ibo youth soon and when. Yes. So my question is they do hear the me way the gov governance, especially make the way youth through discussions because I, 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 we have lost hope in the system. Please. Yes. Uh -huh. As a more, my name is Ebo Daniel, graduate student, University of Nigeria, Isuka Campus. Um, I have two questions for you. Okay, one. Sorry. Okay. Um. I like your um, statement with regards to the events in the southeast, but I would like to raise a point. Um, one issue is this. Today we are having a conversation that involves uh, intellectuals like you, the youth, and some of our elders. I'm also suggesting how can we start a political conversation that is going to comprise the citizenry and the politicians in the southeast. Thank you. Manu Mahi. I want to ask, pertaining to the topic we had, don't you think that a problem we have, part of the problem we have in the South is that we don't really know who our leaders are, and because that is the case, we cannot even demand for anything, just like you've, you've talked about demanding. How many people read the budget? How many people know their reps? How many people know their senators? How many people watch local news? Everybody's watching international news. Who watches ABS? Who watches NTA? If you don't know what is happening around you, if you don't know your leaders, how can we really, we really own the SS? Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Amarachi Nick Abudu. I am a student of Faculty of Law, University of Nigeria. So, um, Dr. Joaba, from what you say on Twitter, I think it's safe to assume that you support restructuring of Nigeria. And I'm going to resist the temptation of asking you specifically what you need when you say restructuring. However, you just dichotomy about being Igbo first before being Nigerian, Nigerian first before being Igbo. So my question is, the Igbo nation must nevertheless exist in this bigger territory we call Nigeria, at least for now, maybe to change in the future, I don't know. But for now, we must exist in Nigeria. So in your own opinion, your, your structuring. How do we fit the agenda of a progressive Indigo without appearing to shut out other regions? Um, the band I know, uh, I found the Kingston shared the more alone. Um, and we're man living there. I'm a man living there. I'm a man who's a man who's a man And I'm a man the sports club. I'm a man Joe Abba, my Juliet. I'm a man who's a man who's a So if you're a man who's 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 a in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Yeah, but I'm going if you help with met but maybe really who can you want to change now? Only people who are so. 
until I am about me, it was as a man thinketh, so is he. Until I am born, it was I am a born way, oh my. I say to I say, man, now Ghanaian room, other room, our future is in peril. Now, I can live with the Okwaka. I call that Fiaro a Bayana campaign. I'm a part of my microphone. Three people a professor, a pastor, or a politician. And uh, I'm two out of three. So I'll be very dangerous. Can you go with Kenyan? Makankata Umebe. Thank you very much. Thank you. In case uh, Patrick and uh, Nana say we've run out of time in the next five seconds, Madame's name is Mrs. Anui Yago. <laughs> Miss Anui Yago. Did I pass? Okay. I think the, a, a number of issues were raised, and there probably isn't enough time for me to address all of them, but they, they're all related in a, in a number of ways. Um, the issue of leadership raised by Frank is very, very pertinent. We are aware of uh, uh, Professor Chino Achebe's diagnosis about the problem with Nigeria being you know, purely and squarely a failure of leadership. Um, what many of us tend not to read further into is where he talks about the sacrifice of personal example that is the hallmark of true leadership. We never read that part. We talk about why leadership is important. We don't talk about the sacrifice of personal example that is the hallmark of true leadership. Chi uh, Diodin Kalu, who you had here a few months ago, was, I believe, the first appointee of government to publicly declare his assets. I was the second. You can imagine how many people have been appointed into government in this country. I was appointed in 2013. I was only the second appointee of government to publicly declare his assets. Such that when I voluntarily stepped down from being DG after one term, um, I got a call from the chairman of EFCC uh, to come and see him because he needed advice on something he was working on. How many DGs will not faint? <laughs> One month after you left office, you got a call from the chairman of EFCC. How many DGs will not faint? But here is the other side of the coin about whoever is carrying the yam. That's the person the uh, carrying the pan front. That's the person the, the goat will follow. Um, my one month salary as a DG will buy you today four hours of my time as a consultant. So, which one do you want to follow? Do you want to follow the one that will make you collapse if the chairman of EFCC were to call you or do you want to declare your assets publicly, live with your, held, with your head held high, and name your price when people come to seek the knowledge you have? These are the conversations we need to start having with our youth. Um, these, are the these are the issues of value that Professor Ogu talked about. These are, the, these are the issues that we need to start to focus on with our youth, not simply sending them to go and learn trade or to, or to pressure them to say your mate has brought back a Mercedes Benz 
what are you doing? And then they will go to Dubai and rob a bureau the chains so that they must so that they can belong. Um, what do we do to, uh, to, to bring our youth back, to, to start to focus on here, is what I said, that our governors, our leaders need to, need to create that environment, that vibrancy, that vibrancy where a bright, bored young man or woman can find expression can find expression in all those ideas that is bubbling up in their heads. I go to, I, 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 I was born here in Enugu. I worked here for a couple of years um, uh, when I first came back from the UK. I see the things happening at IMT. I see some of the things happening in ESU. Forget the fact that ESU is focusing on offering a law degree. University of Technology, University of Science and Technology, the biggest contest is who enters the law faculty, right? Rather than what we actually produce. So we need to start to refocus, refocus that natural inclination for science and technology that we have. Refocus that natural ability for us to tell stories. Chino Achebe, Chino Amanda Adichie, all of this Cipra and Equency. And the reason why people call me is a more is because when I was in government and I realized that I no longer had access to the president in the way that I did before, I started a satire to comment on government issues, even though I was still in government. And as you know, Aneze Moore speaks truth to power. He never fears the king. And so I started this narrative called Ebano Chronicles, Ebano being where we are, of speaking my mind to government, regardless of the fact that I was within that government. We have this ability to tell stories. Patrick's uh, lineage, the, 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 all the poets that we have. We need, to, we need to energize all of that again in our people. And finally, was the example I gave with what Erufai is doing in Kaduna. Those 36 people that he gets every year, don't be surprised if in 20 years time they are the ones ruling your people. Our governors need to start to think as a collective, as a group, as a region, how we can develop the capacity of our youths a lot, of, a lot of Igbo youth, I'm sorry to say this, are the most abusive on social media. They are the most abusive, they are the most insultive, and they are the least knowledgeable. And so we need to start to teach our youth. We need to teach them values. We need to teach them knowledge. We need to teach them the, 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 the leadership. We need to teach them the benefit of being upright, being honest, gaining respect of others beyond simply having money. And that is what I'm hoping that collectively our social cultural organizations such as uh, Ohanese can start to demand of all of our governors. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry if I wasn't able to address all of your specific questions. Um, but I'll just end on, I think, the last question about where being Igbo first or being Nigerian first. If you play the national anthem now, I will jump up. If you play Ewo again, Thank you. Thank you. Please, a round of applause for. Please, another round of applause. <laughs> and just a quick note to uh, say that Dr. Joaba is still with us. So, all the questions that you have, right, you can still engage with him and beyond this platform, of course, on social media um, to continue the conversation. And I'm just going to end on a very um, short note because he talked about 
us tapping into who we are as we're storytellers, we're poets, um, we're, we're good with science and technology. Is it the clouds gather, Nani, and the rains mock us with their absence. The clouds appear, Nani, and the rains drown us with their presence. Sons and daughters of Agadagi. Gay Nunti. Gay Nunti. Who will save us from the brink? A drizzle becomes a flood. And the living dead, you and I, drink from overrun rivers of tears, pus, and blood. Is Sons and daughters of Agadagi. Genanti. Genanti. Dalono. Wow. I'll say that I'm not surprised. We expected it and they over delivered. Please, another round of applause. Let me apologize because I'm a bit of a stickler to time. I always try to start events at the advertised time and end at the advertised time. Um, we're already running 15 minutes over time and I sincerely apologize for that. We have just two more things to do. One is Juliet offered four books for the first four people who showed up. We're going to give the books away. And then I'll invite you, Ben Etiaba, to give the vote of thanks. The four you should just um, see me at the back. Nadi, Flora, Chukumeri, J. Love, Ndukwe, Robert, and Onyeka, Onwe. Thank you. Um, Nadi, Akachi, Chukumeri, J. Love, Ndukwe, Robert, Onyeka, Onwe. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, when I handed over to the Executive Chairman, Honorable Bonye Kongwe, a few days ago, I actually thought this voice was going to be silent here for some time. Uh, but I'm quite happy to speak uh, because I've been asked to do so by Patrick Okibo. And my task is to thank you on behalf of the Center. And the good thing I'm sitting um, with the Center, people from the Center, so, uh, my brother Joe, Dr. Joe Abba, I can tell you that you're a true son of your father. I can also confirm, you have really uh, lit up the hall this evening. And um, Juliet, who I also know, Kego, Onyido, Ume, thank you for the conversation. It's been a great evening. Uh, for all of us in the audience, because there's something Patrick will always say. Don't enjoy these events alone. Okay? We need to get to a stage where this hall is not enough for the audience. And also to make sure you come in good time. But the center does this in partnership with Enugu Sports Club. So the club is actually the host, and please permit me to thank, on behalf of the center, the executive chairman of Enugu Sports Club, my brother, Honorable Onyeka Onwe, for being a good host. And of course, alongside Onyeka, you have members of his executive committee, and of course, the legal advisor of the club, Professor Aguke Bagu, is seated next to Onyeka and the past chairman of this club, who handed over to me, Barry Marum, is also here. So that's for the club. I've been asked by the center to appreciate the presence of first, Professor and Mrs. Kingsley Morgalo, one name Moge.
I am delighted to have you here. I didn't know you were coming. The presence of engineer Sir Chris Okoye, who's always here with us. Chris, we appreciate you. The presence of a man that I know to be exceptional at everything he does, confirmed tonight, architect Ferdinand Agu. Thank you, my brother. The club is here, Sachinedu Ani. Dalu for coming. To my friend and my sister, uh, Professor Joy Ezilo, my phone crashed in November, so I lost your number. So I'm so delighted to see you once again. You're welcome. Professor and Professor or Mrs. Paul Okonko. Thank you for being here. Parents, parents of Ndidi, Amuneli, one of the uh, conveners. Uh, of the Center for Memories. The Honorable Commissioner for Chieftaincy Matters, I believe, my brother, Chijoke Edoga, you're welcome, as usual. People always accuse me of not appreciating and uh, acknowledging my wife, so today I'll do so in a special way, Dr. Eyi Etiawa. Thank you. I always miss any out because uh, we're the same so I, I never professor steve Ogu, the all for coming and i'll tell you something i, I don't know if i've acknowledged uh, frank Weke jr i have not please frank Weke jr who's a friend but something came out of what you said tonight i'm not going to give another lecture i'll just round up in one minute about i find that thing so annoying but it's the second one and i'm so happy that Dr. Joaba was trained in the UK, just like myself. I'm so happy. Because especially when you have a, when you're in a leadership position, that thing is so annoying. Why must we lo olo? Thank you, Munem Dalno. 